I am particularly uh, pleased that um, we are now able to um, introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Uh, this will be Melissa Hathaway, who um, is, as I mentioned earlier, a recognized expert in cybersecurity and um, formerly an advisor to both um, U.S. President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama. So obviously um, an individual who has a real good grasp of a very, very important issue. Again, I'm pleased that AECOM will be sponsoring this particular session. And uh, so I'm pleased to turn the microphone over to Lara Poloni, who is president of AECOM, to introduce uh, our keynote speaker today. I should mention that there will be a Q&A session with Melissa following her remarks, which I will moderate. So I encourage you to be thinking about questions that you might want to pose to her. And um, I look forward to engaging with you and her uh, in just a short while. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lara Poloni, president of ACOM. It's great to be able to join you today from Melbourne. And I'm sure many of you will recognize the spectacular and iconic Gordie Howe International Bridge behind me. This is an example of the outstanding experience ACOM offers in the delivery of the world's most complex projects, many of which involve some form of alternative delivery. And in this case, we were a key part of the bridging North America team, performing the role of the lead design firm. At ACOM, we're proud to be a platinum sponsor of the conference and of today's keynote speaker. We are even more proud to be a long-term member and supporter of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. We at ACOM are firm believers in the importance of the Council's work to drive even greater collaboration between all levels of government, Indigenous communities and the private sector. It's my great pleasure today to introduce your keynote speaker, Melissa Hathaway, the President of Hathaway Global Strategies. Melissa's topic is of great importance to us all, the implications of cybersecurity issues for future-proofing infrastructure. Every year here at ACOM, we produce a report called The Future of Infrastructure. And time after time in that research, we hear from industry respondents around the world that there are no doubt about the challenges ahead, particularly in terms of cyber attacks. Approximately one in three infrastructure professionals believes that cyber-related catastrophic events including citywide transport disruption and even deaths, are a certainty in the near future. Like all of you, I'm really looking forward to hearing Melissa's thoughts on this important topic. As an international cybersecurity expert, Melissa has served in two US presidential administrations, leading the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative for President George W. Bush and spearheading the Cyberspace Policy Review for President Barack Obama. Melissa is a member of the Board of Directors at the Centre of International Governance and a former senior advisor to the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfast Centre for Science and International Affairs Cybersecurity Project. She served on the Board of Directors of several public companies and non-profit organisations and publishes regularly on cybersecurity matters affecting companies and countries. With that, let me welcome Melissa and wish you all well for an informative and successful conference. All right, good morning, everybody. And I wanna thank AECOM for uh, such a wonderful introduction. And it's uh, my pleasure to be here at uh, P3 2020. Mark Romoff, thank you so much for the invitation this morning. And I am here to talk about future proofing our infrastructures and the importance of cybersecurity and digital resilience. If anything, the pandemic has showed us the importance of resilient infrastructures and services at the national level of keeping our countries up and going and, and maintaining our economies for our companies being able to move goods and services across our provinces and borders, our schools to remain open and us as society to remain sane and connected. We had to make a great leap into cyberspace this year and it's required an awful lot of innovation among us within our infrastructures, within among us within our corporations. <clears throat> We've seen the work from home, learn from home, a 1200% increase in collaboration tools like the ones we're using right now for this overall conference in order to share our knowledge. We're also seeing telemedicine and wearable medical devices, diagnostic tools, et cetera, being used um, by uh, many of us now, a, a technology that's been available for more than a decade, but only recently have we adopted because the pandemic has put us into that situation. 
We're seeing a digital transformation underway of society and of our infrastructures. <clears throat> Canada's digital economy is worth over 7% of its overall GDP right now. The largest economic opportunities right and are being driven by Ontario, British Columbia, and Quebec. And we're seeing the more and more digitization of these infrastructures, you'll see Canada's digital economy grow to 20% over the next 10 years. And that 10 year plan is being accelerated the digital transformation as Minister McKenna told us on Tuesday, the investing in Canada, the 10 year plan of $180 billion. And in October, Prime Minister Trudeau added another 10 billion to accelerate clean power and clean energy connectivity to the broader regions of Canada to modernize and create better energy efficiency for our large scale buildings to introduce broader food security so that we can move food across our borders and get better supply lines and create cleaner commutes through a different digital transformation of our transportation industries. That, that 10 billion, that 180 billion, that digital transformation is gonna to contribute to the digital economy of Canada. We're connecting 127 devices every second to this infrastructure and all of our infrastructures in the hope for creating that efficiency and modernization. We're delivering high speed, low latency networks that are essential for the internet of things. And this is through 5G. I wanna give you a perspective of 5G is very different than 4G and it should start to be introduced in our countries and in our cities in the next two to three years. Today, 4G, over a one kilometer area represents about 50 to 75,000 devices that it can support. And 5G will be 10 times that amount, 1 million devices um, across that, that one kilometer. And that 10 times capacity should give us better download rates, better upload rates and support that inf infrastructure um, modernization. It's gonna pave the way for what we in the West call industry 4.0 and what in the East they call society 5.0, major transformations of key sectors. In Canada, you'll start to see smart agriculture be delivered, which represents more than 7% of your GDP, where you're gonna use Robert, robots and internet uh, connected devices to determine the water levels and chemical levels needed for the crops. And you'll be using IP devices to actually determine from uh, farm to table, the overall security of the, of the food supply. You're going to see enhanced logistics and transportations introduced through driverless transport or autonomous vehicles. This is gonna really require Canada to reshape its policy thinking and decision-making of how are we going to introduce new standards and regulations. You're seeing driverless transport corridors being actually tested in Ontario. And you'll see in the United States, you're seeing it in the Northern part of our, um, in, in Michigan and elsewhere. You're also seeing advanced manufacturing introduce of lights out factories where robots are replacing people and those people are actually can actually control those robots from a work from home situation. Advanced ma manufacturing, robotics, uh, advanced microelectronics in the Ontario area and down in Waterloo actually are going to start to drive the more than 10% of, the, of uh, the GDP of Canada. And you're seeing smart cities roll out, applying digital technologies to employ and connect and power connect um, and connect communities. In Bridgewater, you're seeing um, uh, uh, energy initiatives start through the different 20 uh, smart city pilots. And in Montreal, you're seeing it being used for mobility and food security. Overall, as we connect more and more of our infrastructures to the internet and become hyper-connected, it should unlock $13 trillion of economic value um, by 2035. But the speed of innovation, it really drives our exposure and we have to manage that risk responsibly. When you start to think about, it's the imperative to future-proof our infrastructures. As we come, become more connected, we are becoming more vulnerable. So we have to buy down that risk. Just to give you a perspective in 2020, we've seen a 715% increase in ransomware attacks where your systems are encrypted and you have to pay a ransom in order to have them uh, released. And um, we're seeing 150% 
of distributed denial of service attacks, knocking your businesses and infrastructures offline when you need to be online. And you're seeing a 600% increase in the internet of things attacks of those vulnerable devices that you're connecting your core infrastructure and business operations to. These are untenable statistics and will continue to grow in the future if we don't start to manage this risk and start to address the vulnerabilities. The disruptive and destructive activities are increasing at an exponential scale. You might have seen the CSE report yesterday <clears throat> that talks about the malicious activities by nation states that are pre-positioning weapons into our core infrastructures. We're seeing the disruption of critical services and infrastructures of businesses. We're seeing hacking of international financial institutions and stealing from the cryptocurrency exchanges. We're seeing influence and propaganda campaigns that are meant to undermine our democracy. And we're seeing a number of areas where nation states and others are stealing sensitive corporate data, intellectual property and our personal data to monetize it in the underground economy. You have to ask, how did we get here? We got here because of our digital environment is insecure. We became critically dependent upon these internet and information communication technologies over the last 30 years. We made a conscious decision in the 1990s to actually connect these infrastructures for the hope of better efficiency, modernization, and to drive our digital economy and GDP growth. Most products, however, come with the principle of field it fast and fix it later. Patch Tuesday, therefore, leads to Vulnerable Wednesday in the core of your businesses and in the core of our infrastructures. To give you a perspective, Microsoft has patched over 1,100 vulnerabilities this year. 15% are critical. Critical meaning I can gain access to your infrastructure and I could potentially shut it down. Oracle has the same as more than 1,600 for this year, of which one third are critical vulnerabilities. Again, critical vulnerabilities mean I can actually knock you offline when you need to be online. These unpatched systems are very easy to find on the internet. It's free and easy and the tools are cheap and available and be seconds to gain access to your enterprise or your infrastructure. And this is the state of that we are living in right now as we become more connected. So I have to ask you is how resilient is the organization? How resilient are your critical services and infrastructures? The telecom cloud and infrastructure outages this year have been very alarming. We've seen Tata Communications have a worldwide outage. IBM had a cloud outage that was worldwide. In the United States, T-Mobile went down for more than eight hours knocking emergency services offline. In the United Kingdom, Sky, Talk Talk, and Virgin Media all brought London offline for more than four hours. You're seeing Zoom, Equinix, Telstra, and all around the world, our telecommunications infrastructures are, um, are being challenged and the fragility is actually showing us that we have to as nations and we have to as corporations invest more. The, uh, in Vancouver Island, you saw malicious software in February that actually uh, knocked its production capabilities offline and deliveries were missed. Malicious software is, is um, every company and every infrastructure is having to deal with the defense of those um, from malicious software. We've seen widespread destruction also from malicious software, affecting everything from transportation to energy grids, to our food supply, to consumer electronics, financial services, and hundreds of billions of dollars to supply chain disruption, as in addition to the corporate capital destruction that we've seen. You're also seeing the industrial control systems weaponized um, in different parts of the world. And they're uh, going after petrochemical uh, stations, after oil and gas, after water supply. And they are going to put at risk life and safety. And we have to address these issues. We're also seeing ransomware at scale, as I said earlier, 700%. And this maze ransomware is actually running off of infected devices in the Canadian infrastructure, knocking its own companies offline, insurance, accounting, IT services, defense contractors, electronics. And what happens is, is they get in through one of those Microsoft or Oracle vulnerabilities, they exfiltrate your data, they encrypt your systems, and then they demand a ransom. And so the value at risk to you and your infrastructure is, is you will have business disruption, you'll have data loss, you'll have regulatory fines. And it's really, again, at an epidemic kind of scale of what's happening in ransomware. 
So we have to talk about how do we future-proof our infrastructures, the need for resilience, digital resilience as we're moving forward, which requires us at a national level to strategically assess what's at stake and at a corporate level per our infrastructures to strategically assess what's at stake. What are our critical dependencies? the core companies that drive our GDP, the infrastructures that power our countries, the assets that we can't afford to lose, that if harmed would cause grave economic and national security consequences. Doing that national and corporate assessment is essential. We have to also remember that a private public partnership really is a partnership. It requires us to work together. It's also a legal contract where I have to get something out of it and you have to get something out of it. And it's mutual cooperation and responsibility to achieve a specified goal. So when we're talking about a private public partnership and we're talking about digital resilience of our critical infrastructures, we have to be very specific on what goal we're trying to achieve and what's your job and what's my job in order to achieve that. Within that, we see that there's lots of things that are available and around for us that the industry 4.0 and society 5.0 require us to think about resilience, security, uh, and privacy by design at its core. We can't have a future where we're fielding the technologies fast and worrying about the security vulnerabilities later. It's our responsibility to design it right and field it right. We have to understand that there's a lot of guidance out there. The securing of the internet of things for consumers was just released a few weeks ago from Australia. Yesterday, the guidelines from ANISA were released on securing the internet of things. And then we have industry associations that talk about the internet of things and why, and why you have to build security privacy by design. There are guidance out there that we can follow in order to actually drive our future and future-proof our infrastructures. We also need to operationalize the information. Our intelligence and militaries have great insight into what are the threats, but so do our corporations. And there's a stop like protocol that's been designed by the financial services industry that could be adopted by other industries of, of um, stoplight protocol is the speed of response. So if it's red, that means emergency, all hands on deck, we need to actually address this threat. Amber means that we need to think about it um, and start to prepare for these issues. And green is, is really kind of just an alert of, I'm seeing this type of activity on my infrastructures. We also are going to need to operationalize our defense. And there's really important private public partnerships that already exist in Canada. The Canadian Cyber Threat Exchange led by my friend, Bob Gordon is a not-for-profit for enabling that threat information sharing from the government to industry and industry back to the government and helping prepare our critical infrastructures for better resilience in the future. Project Lighthouse being run in the energy community is also an important cooperation from CSE and the, and the energy providers to try to build that resilience in and anticipate and look for the pre-positioned weapons that are being put in our infrastructures by our adversaries. We also need to be creative and seek alternatives because our broadband to the last mile in Canada and in the United States is terrible. We can't actually reach the last mile. So we need to be creative in thinking about space delivery of broadband and it's available. SpaceX has got almost 23,000 satellites on its way to 42,000. Uh, Amazon's Kuiper has been approved for another 3,000. OneWeb has got 48,000 already launched and Telesat specifically covering Canada, 298. You can get better and cheaper telecom from space than you can from most of our terrestrial providers. If we start to think about this of reliable affordable and available telecommunications infrastructure, it is what powers the rest of our critical infrastructures. We also need to be transparent in the decision-making of when we choose one path over another or one vendor over another. Our, we need to communicate why we're making those decisions. And then finally, we have to raise awareness and develop the skills. Our digital future as we connect more of our critical infrastructures means that we have to prepare the current generation and the next generation to be able to deliver uh, these services and infrastructures secure by design, architect by design, um, the security, privacy, and resiliency for the future. As you start to think about, um, as you start to think about this uh, partnership, the private public partnership is driving towards a common goal, future-proofing that infrastructure 
and understanding the security resilience needs requires relationship, cooperation, and mutual accountability. As we head to our future, the digital transformation is now, we've accelerated it in 2020. Are you ready and are you resilient? We need to future-proof our infrastructures. Thank you so much, Mark and everybody, and I look forward to your questions. Oof, Melissa, that was terrific. Um, I must admit that uh, both exciting and very frightening. Uh, so thank you for uh, a stimulating talk. I, I think you've got everybody's attention at the moment. Um, what I will say, you may not know this, but um, I was kindly invited by the Minister of Infrastructure to actually chair the Canadian Smart Cities Challenge. And of course, uh, Bridgeport was one of the cities that was a winner um, of that uh, uh, challenge. And we were all very excited because so many cities were, were really getting it right in terms of understanding the importance of technology and adopting it broadly. And then of course, along comes Melissa Hathaway and scares the heck out of us um, with the comments that you've made, but it, it is really a call to action. There's no doubt about that. Um, I do apologize. We're probably not gonna be able to take any questions because uh, time is uh, really up um, for this session, but I did want to let people know that we'd be happy to receive your questions. Please send them in and we will make sure that uh, we address them uh, over the next couple of days. And hopefully, Melissa, we can send some along to you too. Yes, that of we course. Might receive. Um, but I, I, I did want to make sure that I took the opportunity, one, to thank you for what is a very stimulating presentation but also to let you know that we are making a donation in your name um, to an organization called Inspire, which is a national indigenous charity that is very focused on investing in the education of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people uh, across Canada for their long-term benefit of these individuals, their families and their communities. And it's a, it's a small way in which um, we wanna recognize your very significant uh, contribution through your remarks today. So thank you so very much, Melissa. I really appreciate this. You've added enormous uh, substance to, uh, to our conference. Um, thank you again. Thanks, Mark. Um,